Hello and welcome to My PGCE, a podcast documenting my journey as a trainee teacher with a special focus on mental health. I am your host, James B. Good morning. Another week of the PGCE done, and as usual, I'm here now on Saturday morning to tell you all about it. Monday was, as usual, a university day, but it wasn't in person this week. It was a remote university day. The morning session was all about marking and feedback, and I must admit I paid very little attention. This is one of the dangers I find, for me, when trying to do things remotely. My attention invariably wanders. And on Monday morning, I still had one lesson to plan. So instead of listening to the session about marking and feedback, I planned that lesson instead. But I've made a note of the resources that were used in that session, and they're now on my reading list, so I will return to them at some point. At lunchtime, we had the SSLC, which is the Staff Student Liaison Committee, where we discussed a variety of things, but mainly communication from the department, well-being, and essay feedback including the fact that a deaf girl on our course was given her feedback as an audio file. I know, right? After lunch, we had a careers session. And again, I don't think I was paying as much attention as I perhaps should have been, because my notes for that session comprised just four words, sign up to eteach.com, which is a job-seeking website for teachers and generally for careers in education. After the career session, I had a mock interview with a assistant head teacher from a local school. In fact, it's a school that's part of the same trust as the school that I visited last week, the inner city school that I spoke about. Quick side note, I've requested for my second PGCE placement. So as part of the PGCE, you do two different school placements, one up until Christmas and one afterwards. I've requested that my second one be in that school that I visited last week, the inner city school. For several reasons, I think it would be a really good contrast with my current school, which is a rural school in a fairly affluent area. And also, I'm tentatively interested in applying for a job there at the inner city school. So I thought it would be good to spend some time there before applying and committing myself to a career there, or to the start of a career there anyway. That was the side note. So going back to what I was talking about, I had a mock interview on Monday afternoon with an assistant head teacher, which went well. It went well enough for her to take my email address at the end, in case there are any vacancies that come up at her school. The two main pieces of feedback I received were to try to develop a poker face when I'm in an interview, because all of my answers to her questions were fine, she said, from her point of view, but there were one or two answers that I gave that I wasn't particularly pleased with, and apparently it showed on my face. I looked dissatisfied with my answer. Um, So I need to have... I need to try and hide that and um, look as though I'm delighted with all of my answers. The second thing we discussed was um, what questions should I, as the interviewee, ask the interviewer at the end of the interview? Two good things to ask about. CPD, so that's continued, or is it continual? Anyway, 
It's the P and the D that are important. It's professional development. So to ask the school, to ask the interviewer what professional development the school offers, because that shows that you're interested in improving and progressing in your career, which is bound to go down well. And also to have a look at the curriculum for your subject in that school beforehand and have a few questions, at least one, you can ask about the curriculum. Just to show that you've done your homework. I mean, I guess those sorts of questions could have come up earlier in the interview, but if they haven't, it's good to sneak them in there at the end. So that was Monday. Tuesday, back in school. First thing Monday morning, I taught my year seven class. I delivered a lesson on multiplying negative numbers. Then I observed three lessons. Well, four lessons, actually. The first three were maths and the final one was RE. No, I tell a lie. RE that day was a revision session, so there wasn't a great deal to observe, so I had a free instead. On Wednesday, I observed a computer science lesson. Then I taught my year eights. What did I teach them? Okay, it was expanding single brackets. Afterwards, I had a lesson observation. On Thursday, I observed another computer science lesson, then a year 11 maths lesson, which was a revision lesson, which was taking place in one of the computer rooms. They were doing their revision on a website. And last thing on Thursday, I taught my year eights again, this time expanding double brackets. Then on Friday, I Observed one lesson, a year 10 lesson, and then in the afternoon I taught my year 7s about expanding double brackets. So the same topic as I'd had with the year 8s the day before. It's quite good at the moment because it's a spiral curriculum. I say at the moment, I presume this would be the case throughout the year actually, given the fact that it is a spiral curriculum. So each year you revisit the same topics and build on them progressively. So I'm teaching a year seven top set and a year eight middle set at the moment. They're both doing algebra and they're both at about the same level. So this week, for instance, I had two lessons with each year group, so four in total. But I only had to plan two lessons. In each lesson, I delivered twice. Well, that's what I'd usually do. This week, it was a little bit different because I taught the Year 7s about multiplying negative numbers, which was a review session, which the Year 8s didn't have. But usually, if I'm teaching, say, six lessons in a week, I only need to plan three and deliver each one twice. Works out quite well. Something very important I forgot to mention. In that year seven class on Friday afternoon, expanding double brackets, I was observed by not only my subject mentor, as usual, but also my professional mentor. Okay? Something I'll return to in the zooming in section. After that year seven lesson was my mentor meeting. So I've never really spoken about what we do in these mentor meetings. The main thing we do, so in a nutshell, we look at whether I have met last week's targets. We fill that in on a form and then together form next week's targets. And then we just do various other admin. It took us a while, took us several mental meetings before we got into a good routine, but they seem to be running like clockwork now. So that was the week. Now, there are two things I want to zoom in on this week. First of all, 
the saga of the mini whiteboards. So, as I said, my professional mentor was observing me in that year seven class on Friday afternoon, yesterday afternoon. And my subject mentor had encouraged me to pull out all the stops, all the bells and whistles, to impress my professional mentor. We spoke last Friday in my mentor meeting about breaking out the mini whiteboards, which are no doubt a great way to assess student understanding. So in essence, you would ask the class a question and instead of then just calling on one or two students for the answer, all the students write their answers on their mini whiteboards and then hold up their mini whiteboards. You can glance around the room and get a feel for whether they understood what you've just taught. They can be a really powerful tool when it comes to um, assessment for learning. That said, I'd never used them before, and I was worried that trying to use them for the first time when my professional mentor was observing me could be a recipe for disaster. My subject mentor agreed and said, OK, you need to practice then. So we decided that I would practice with the mini whiteboards with my year eight class on Thursday afternoon. And that was the same topic as I would be teaching my year sevens on the Friday when my professional mentor would be observing. So that seemed like the perfect time to practice. But it didn't go to plan and for several reasons. So first of all, this year eight class is more difficult in terms of behavior than the year seven class. It was also the last period of the day. So it's always a tricky one. I had all the mini whiteboards, whiteboard pens, cloths set out on the desks beforehand. And from the second the students entered the room, the whiteboards just seemed to serve as a massive distraction. So despite the fact that the mini whiteboards were there on the table, I wanted them to do the starter exercise as usual, write it down in their books. But they were, of course, completely sidetracked by the, by the mini whiteboards. So that was already a bit of a battle. Then, after the starter, when I got to the part of the lesson when I explain today's topic and run through a few examples... I myself was distracted by the whiteboards because I could see around the room that students were being distracted by the whiteboards. I found out afterwards that what I should have done was handed out the whiteboards just before they were needed rather than having them on the table beforehand. Anyway, it was too late for that. So I was a bit distracted by the level of distraction in the class and my explanation wasn't as good or as clear as it would usually be. It was also a more complicated topic than usual. We'd done expanding single brackets the day before, but expanding double brackets is a bit of a leap up. I'd also overestimated the ability of this group and I went through a few examples which were just a little bit too complicated for them. So after going through a few examples, at last the time came for the students to use their mini whiteboards. I put a question on the board. They were to write down the answer and then hold it up. So I gave them some time. And when I asked them to raise their whiteboards with their answers on, only about six whiteboards went, went up out of a class of 27. That was discouraging. And I then realised that <laughs> I was meant to be checking for answers. I didn't actually know the answer to this particular question yet. I had to look back to the board, work out the answer quickly in my own head before I could turn back to the class and see whether anyone had gotten it right. Expanding double brackets also involves quite a lot of 
working, relatively speaking, compared to, say, expanding single brackets. And the whiteboards aren't very big, and the students' handwriting isn't very good. So I was looking around at this, at all this scrawl, and because I haven't been a teacher, I think as a as an experienced teacher, you get very good at deciphering student handwriting, but I'm not there yet. And I couldn't, for the life of me, make out any correct answers. I also kept forgetting what the correct answer was and had to turn back to the to the board and refigure out the correct answer. The only thing I could make out was one student, instead of writing down the answer, had just drawn a picture of himself looking very confused, which made me smile, which only encouraged him and all his mates to do exactly the same thing. And it was all just a bit of a mess. I realised then that my explanation had been poor, and I'd also asked too much of my students. I'd over I'd overestimated their ability level. So I kind of had to think on my feet, really, because the next four or five examples I wanted to go through were more complicated still. So I knew that they were a write-off. So I went back to basics, did some much simpler examples, and managed to get through to most of them. Well, I'd say maybe 60% of them. I got through to enough of them that I could then hand out the worksheet and they could crack on with some independent work. There were still a fair few who hadn't a clue what we were doing. So while they were cracking on, while those who understood were cracking on with the worksheet, I tried to direct the attention of the rest back to me, back to the board, where I went through more examples still. But all the while, the bloody mini whiteboards were still serving as a distraction. Again, I found out afterwards that they should have only been out on the table when they were needed, and I should, by this point, have collected them back in. But I didn't. So I went through a few simpler examples with those who were still struggling to understand, and soon enough they started to get the idea so they could have a go at the independent work too, and I moved around the classroom and helped individuals who were still struggling. But also, it was just that time of day. Like, I'd, I hadn't been a very good teacher when I was doing my explanations. I was, I'd pitched it wrong, I was distracted, and I rushed it. So, understandably, the kids weren't entirely sure what to be doing. And also, period five, they'd kind of just lost the will to try to understand, and I don't blame them. So yeah, there were a few few students in the class who were just on the verge of giving up. But still, I persevered with them, and I think by the end of it, most of the class, if not all of the class, understood how to do the most simple problems. Afterwards, I felt that it was my worst lesson yet. It wasn't disastrous, because I think, like I said, most of the students, if not all of them, had some understanding by the end of it so that's okay but it was just messy and the students were distracted I was distracted the mini whiteboards weren't the only problem like I said I'd overestimated their ability Um, that was probably the main problem but the whiteboards just made everything so much worse (laughs) and um, my mentor didn't seem to think it was a particularly bad lesson But the first thing I said to him afterwards was, I'm not using the mini whiteboards tomorrow. I'm not going to attempt to do it again tomorrow with my year sevens when my professional mentor is observing. I said I'd save it for another time. I will get the mini whiteboards back out one day, but it won't be tomorrow. So for my lesson with my professional mentor with the year sevens on Friday afternoon, same topic. I went back to basics, returned to the same lesson structure as I had been teaching before. Yeah, no mini whiteboards. Um, And I slowed down my explanations. I spent much more time on the simpler examples. I also simplified the worksheet that they were to work through. And on the whole, it was a much better lesson. The one thing that went wrong, though, 
and it had to go wrong when my professional mentor was observing. This has never happened before. I'd printed off all the main exercise sheets, the easier worksheets that I wanted kind of every student to focus on. But then I printed out a bunch of um, extension exercise sheets for the students who completed the first sheet. But instead of printing off 30 of those, half of them were answer sheets. And I realised this when I started hand- handing out the sheets and the student said, oh, sir, I think, I think you've given me the answer sheet. And I was like, oh, sorry. Thinking then that there was only one because I'd only planned to print off one answer sheet. And I looked down into my hand and I was like, oh, my God, they're all answer sheets. They weren't all answer sheets, but half of them were, which meant with this year seven class, most of whom flew through the first worksheet, it meant I didn't have enough. I didn't have enough um, worksheets for the extension exercise. But it wasn't too bad because I leveled with the class. I owned up and they thought it was quite entertaining. And I just put the exercises on the board instead. And if anything, I think it showed my professional mentor that when little things like that do go wrong, as they no doubt will very often, I managed to think on my feet and come up with a with a solution. Afterwards, my professional mentor said um, she thought it was great which is really encouraging because I tend to catastrophize and be quite self-critical. But she said that all of the big things that a teacher needs, I seem to already have. Uh, And it's just a matter of tweaking and making minor improvements here and there for me to progress. For example, like just being able to raise the the volume of of your voice. This was something my, my professional mentor told me about. In the feedback session, she said um, that's something that a lot of teachers to begin with really have to work on. So I'm not talking about shouting here. I'm just talking about raising the volume of your voice. But thankfully, I've, I can do that already. So that's one less thing I need to work on. So that was the saga of the mini whiteboards. The second thing I want to zoom in on relates to this, to be honest, relates to the saga of the mini whiteboards. So when my subject mentor found out that my professional mentor was coming to observe a lesson, like I said, he encouraged me to pull out all the stops and add all the bells and whistles, put on a show, basically. And I kind of thought, well, wouldn't it be better if I just taught as I normally would? Because then the feedback I get, I'll be able to apply to every lesson. If I put on this completely unique show of a lesson, then the feedback I receive will have very narrow applicability. Like it'll only apply for when I try to put on such a show, which will be how often? I don't know. Whenever I'm being observed? I don't know. I thought it would be better to teach as I normally would, which is what I ended up doing uh, after the uh, mini whiteboard fiasco with the year eights. But then I thought... This seems to be common practice. So take Ofsted, for example. They are the Office for Standards in Education. I had to look that up. And they're responsible for inspecting a range of educational institutions, including state schools and some independent schools. Anyway, they're the people, they're the inspectors. They come in to make sure you're doing a good job. And you find out, a school finds out the day before. Often what happens then is that teachers burn the midnight oil, ensuring that their lessons have all the bells and whistles in order to impress the inspectors. But then surely the inspectors aren't seeing what happens in a school on a day-to-day basis. Instead, they're observing what can happen when teachers are at their absolute best. But what a um, teacher can do, what they're capable of doing, their full potential, 
that's no indicator of what they do do on a regular basis, day in, day out, when the inspectors aren't there. You could have a school full of incredibly talented, but also incredibly lazy teachers, so that when the Ofsted inspectors come in, they see this incredible teaching and accordingly award the school outstanding. But the second they're out the door, all these teachers revert to their default setting of laziness. And the school, in fact, on a day-to-day basis, doesn't deserve that outstanding status. It's just a little, a little thought experiment to show how what Ofsted inspectors see is potentially no indicator whatsoever of what goes on on a day-to-day basis in schools. Now, obviously, I'm very new to teaching. I haven't experienced an Ofsted inspection myself. This is all just stuff I've heard about from other teachers. But it does raise some interesting questions as to the utility of these Ofsted inspections. Do they factor this in when doing their reviews of schools? Do they acknowledge the fact that they're not seeing really what goes on on a day-to-day basis, but instead what teachers can do at their best. Do they factor that in? I'd like to think so. And perhaps would it be better if schools were, giving no, were given no warning at all? I'm not sure, but it is interesting. Anyway, okay, that's all the zooming in I want to do this week. How's my mental health been? My mental health has been largely fine. Good, in fact. Yet there was one moment this week. It was during that year 11 revision session in the computer room on Thursday. A student asked me to help her. And it was a relatively simple question about ratios. And I knew... I could get the answer. I knew how to get the answer, but I just couldn't do it. I'd read the question and I just couldn't seem to get further than that. It didn't seem to want to seep into my brain um, and my brain didn't want to cooperate. The best way I can describe it, imagine you're struggling to get your car to start and you're turning the key in the ignition and you're hearing that horrible noise and the engine just won't start. That was like what was happening in my brain. I was turning the key in the ignition. All I could hear was that horrible noise, and my brain was refusing to start. And so I I just, I couldn't help her. I I tried my best, but had to um, ask the teacher to come over instead. And I listened to his explanation, and I was like, oh yeah, that's it. It's so obvious. I knew how to do that. I just couldn't do it. Now, what does this have to do with my mental health? I think it may be an indicator of running out of capacity. This was something that I discussed one of the earlier episodes of the podcast. So our mental resilience is often determined by how much free capacity we have. If we've got free capacity, then if a new problem, if we're confronted with a new problem, then we've got spare resources which we can use to deal with it. But if, we're, if we've maxed out our capacity and we've got no room left, then should a new problem come along in a year 11 revision session, a problem to do with ratios, if you're maxed out, then you've got nothing left to give. You've got no resources spare which you can use to help this student, with this problem. And I think that's what happened. I think it shows that I'm pretty maxed out in terms of capacity. And so things are fine because I have fairly strong routines. I have things fairly planned out. I do most of my lesson planning and in general my planning for the week at the weekend so that during the week I can just focus on what's in front of me. So rarely does an unexpected problem come along. 
So even if I'm at full capacity, rarely do I find myself in a situation where that's an issue. But on this occasion, yeah, maybe I was especially maxed out and this problem came along and I just couldn't couldn't deal with it. So I need to think about some strategies to free up some capacity, maybe. I already have a rule where once I've left school in the evening, I don't do any work at home, which I think is quite good. But this has led me to staying quite late sometimes after school. Perhaps I should be a little bit stricter with myself and go home earlier and rest more in the evenings. That'll be one of my targets for next week. I'll see how it goes. And I'll report back. Maybe not next Saturday, because my partner's coming to visit. But definitely the Saturday afterwards. I'll see. This upcoming week is only is a shorter week. I'm only at school Tuesday to Thursday, because Friday is like a just a random day of holiday for this school. I don't really understand it. It's called a disaggregated something or other. But I'm not complaining. So the fact that I'm only going to be in school three days next week may mean that there's less to talk about this time next week anyway. But I'll see. I'll see what happens. Um, I hope you've had a lovely week and I hope your week to come is lovely also. If you like the episode, please spread the word in person and on social media. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at MyPGCEPod or email MyPGCEPod at gmail.com. Please subscribe, rate and review in your directory of choice. Please also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash MyPGCEPod and helping fund both the podcast and my PGCE course. Thank you and talk again soon.